Good afternoon. BEMA is excited to kick off our 2021 webinar series. Uh, we're bringing you six tips for successfully exhibiting at a virtual event. For those of you whom I've met, hello again. Um, for those new to BEMA, my name is Emily Bowers. I'm the Vice President of Education and Operations for BEMA, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Um, throughout the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to participate, ask questions, um, and use the chat feature. We'll also save some time at the end for Q&A. Um, all of our webinars are also recorded, and they are on our website for viewing at your pleasure. Um, if you've missed a previous webinar or want to share uh, this one or another with a colleague, just go visit our website. Um, with those few details taken care of, I'll give a brief introduction of Emily, and then I'll hand it over to Emily, okay? Um, this is Emily Golding, Senior Account Manager for MDG, a Freeman company. Um, Emily is a marketing communications leader and a strategic problem solver, um, believing in a balance of creativity and attention to detail. Um, she's overseen marketing and in-person and virtual events um, for a wide range of industries, including food service, retail, audiovisual, spa and wellness, tech and medical. Uh, most recently, Emily has been working closely with her colleagues at Freeman to consult clients on their transition to virtual and hybrid events. So Emily, welcome and thanks for being with us this afternoon. Hi, yes, um, let's see. I'm not sure if I'm sharing my video, my, my <laughs> screen correctly here. Let me just cancel that. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be here. Um, and let's see, I'm just trying to make sure that I can show you guys my PowerPoint. Let me just try that again. Okay. Um, in the meantime, um, thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys inviting me. Um, I, you know, I'm looking forward to talking about virtual exhibiting. I know it's, it's kind of a new and different, exciting opportunity. Um, so just to let you guys know a little bit about me before we jump in, um, like uh, Kelly said, my name is Emily Golding and I work on the account strategy team at MDG. So we're a leading event uh, marketing uh, association who some of you might know us from our work with uh, some of the events that you've exhibited at, but you might also know our parent company, Freeman. Um, and uh, Freeman's one of the largest event management companies in the world. So we definitely know events, we know live events and virtual events. Um, and we're, we're, we understand that this is kind of a new and different time. So we just wanted to take some time to kind of go over some tips that we have for uh, successfully exhibiting. So I'm going to try one more time to see if I can share my PowerPoint. I might need to, let's see here. It's one of those things where, you know, we test it and it works perfectly and then. That's the joy, the joy of technology. Right. Okay. So I think it's working. Can you guys see it? I still okay. see you. Okay. Okay, what about now? I still see you. Okay. Let's see. Um let me try one more thing. Oh, there, oh, there we go. There Yay! Is. Okay, third time's a charm. All right. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. I think um, if any of you have exhibited at a virtual event before and we'll actually be asking about that, um, you, you might know that sometimes there's some blips that we have to work through. Um, so we, we talked a little bit already about what, uh, what we'll go over here. So you can see kind of the agenda and then um, my face, but you can also see me here on the screen. So I'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, there we go, not gonna touch anything anymore. Uh, so we're going to start with something that seems like it might be kind of basic, um, which is goal setting. And I'm going to bring this up a couple times throughout the webinar. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, you know, oftentimes we hear from exhibitors and from event organizers and even from attendees that their expectation when participating in a virtual event is that it's just going to be the same thing as a live event, but, you know, in person um, or not in person, but online, right? So like the experiences are the same and, and you know, all of that. But it's actually not the case. 
And because of that, um, you know, it's really important to take a step back before you pick what event you want to partake in and how you should exhibit um, to really set your goals and ask the question, um, you know, why am I exhibiting? What do I want to achieve by doing so? And answering that question is going to make everything else so much easier as we flow through our planning process. Um, and some common goals, which, you know, really aren't so different than when you were exhibiting in person are bringing in new leads, um, you know, maintaining and defending some of those key relationships, uh, closing sales, you know, and often, you know, it's just to generate awareness, right? So when you are exhibiting at a virtual event, it should stem back from that larger business objective. So if your company is launching a new product, then your exhibiting goal can focus a lot more on generating awareness around that product. But if your organization is at a place where you need to really, you know, increase revenue and fast, then your goal needs to be focused on the bottom of the funnel, which is closing sales. So, you know, regardless of what your goal is, once you have it set, you want to make sure that you're identifying key performance indicators uh, up front. So we call those KPIs, and it's just something that you can use to measure your, your performance. It's a big part of marketing strategy, um, you know, and we we like to put something in place in advance so that then when we're done with our event, we can go back and say, did we do our jobs and did we get what we needed done? So um, another point here I think that's interesting to note is that virtual events are actually more similar to advertising than they are in-person events. So one of the most important value points I think that they bring is that there's this opportunity for branding and exposure, almost more so than you have you know, with an in-person event. So one of the KPIs that we recommend looking at is return on impressions. And that's something that helps you measure brand awareness. And then, you know, another point on this kind of topic is that even though your business objectives aren't necessarily changing, um, you know, maybe they scaled up or scaled down since the pandemic, um, your path for actually achieving those goals is going to look a lot different. So um, we'll talk about that next because we're going to get into kind of how do you actually select the right event. So um, I think, Kelly, we have a question here that you might be able to prompt up on the, yes, perfect. Okay, so the question is, have you exhibited at a virtual event? So I think it might take a minute for people's answers to come in. Um, and Kelly, you can probably let me know once you see them. But, you know, I, I know, I know some people on this call definitely have, and if, you know, if you haven't, you, you might be considering doing so soon. Um, we, we have a benefit here at MDG of getting access to some of the Freeman research that comes out. And one of the most recent reports said that, you know, yes, live events are coming back and we will have some events happening in 2021. They're most likely, you know, later in the year. Um, but, you know, even when we do have live events come back, there's going to be a virtual component to them because attendees are really enjoying the ability to absorb content that way. Um, so it looks like it's pretty split. We have 46% who say they have and 54% say they have not. And then I'm sure those who have have probably had mixed experiences, right? Some might have been really good, some might have been challenging. So hopefully what we're covering today is going to help, um, you know, help you really find the ways to drive ROI. So you probably have seen a lot of the events that you exhibited at in person now offering some kind of live component. Um, so, you know, you want to start by looking at those, um, but you also should consider exhibiting at virtual events that you've never participated in before for their live session, because maybe it was too expensive, it was too far away, it overlapped with another event. So one of the great things about virtual events is that those barriers are lifted and that goes the same with attendees. So we actually see that there's an opportunity with virtual to bring in far more attendees and more buyers to the event virtually than would have been in person. Um, but, you know, so there's all these options. There's, there's a variety of different events that you can choose from. Um, and, you know, how do you make that selection? What do you, you know, how do you, how do you kind of pick which one to go to? And um, that's what we're going to kind of go through next. So it should actually be based on your goals. So I, I, I said I would bring that up a couple times and here's the first time. Um, but, you know, you're going to want to start by looking at things like your um, attendee demographics. Are your existing customers going to be there? Um, will you be able to meet new people? Are you trying to launch a new product? So, you know, going back to some of those goals, how do they align with the event that you're evaluating? Um, you can also look at the options outside of the booth. 
So that's something we'll talk about quite a bit on this webinar. Um, and that, what I mean by that is, you know, what are the features of the event platform? Um, is there a chat feature? Is there an ability to access advanced uh, tracking so that you know who's been into your booth and how they've interacted with your you know, content? Um, because that's gonna let you drive and measure your ROI. Um, does the booth uh, and platform setup work with the content that you have available? You know, you, you probably have existing content that you're gonna try to use for this event. So making sure that it works within their format is, is really important. And speaking of content, um, one of the most important tips I think that I have in this whole time that we're together is to make sure you're not underestimating the value of content and how important it is when it comes to your virtual exhibiting strategy. So I'd mentioned before that we have access to some Freeman research, which really helps us kind of look, look to you know, the future as much as we can. We don't have a, a crystal ball, but data does help. Um, and it's looking like, 40% um, of attendees say that one of the reasons they attend a virtual event is to access content. And it's not just education content, it's content from exhibitors, from sponsors, um, you know, from a lot of the different ways that you can kind of absorb that content through an event. So as an exhibitor, it's really important for you to capitalize on that insight and think about, um, you know, how you're getting in front of attendees outside of your booth by using content. So um, specifically, that might look like, you know, speaking opportunities, um, adding an option to your package that allows you to be featured in an innovation showcase. So some of those same things that you might have done, you know, in person, or that you might have never paid attention to when you were exhibiting in an in-person event, it's really worth looking at those for virtual. And um, the whole idea is that you want to attract attendees and you want to get their attention outside of your booth so that you bring them into your booth. Um, and you know that's that's definitely a strategy you know a strategy level thing to think about upfront, especially when you're selecting which event you want to attend or which event you want to exhibit at. And then you know the last point that we have here is just thinking about um, events in virtual events in a new way. So you know we're not dealing in the face-to-face -face world here. We're dealing in what we call like the attention economy. And so consider doing a bright a, a price comparison of your booth to digital advertising or other kind of lead gen activities. Um, that's gonna give you a little bit closer measurement of ROI than like the cost to actually go to an in-person booth, or excuse me, in-person event. Okay, so now that we have covered how to select which event you're going to exhibit at, um, we'll move into intentionally building your booth. Um, and like the other tips that we've gone through, it's actually a few tips in one. Um, and, you know, the whole idea with this, with this section is that, um, you know, you want to make sure that every single decision you make about your booth and how it looks and how you interact with attendees within that booth um, is very intentional. So, you know, I'll, I would just start by saying that I think everyone agrees that this pandemic has been awful. Um, it has impacted all of us personally, professionally, um, you know, all kinds of different ways. And our industry really has suffered. You know, the events industry has has gone through a really big change, but it also brought a forced opportunity to rethink how we do things as you know, event organizers, as um, event marketers, as exhibitors, and make sure that what we're doing is really developing the best brand experience that we can. And what I'm saying today applies to virtual, but you know, I do think that this is going to be applying to future in-person events as well. Um, and so, you know, it's just kind of a mindset shift to think outside of the, um, the kind of approach that we all have taken, I think, before where there's a little bit of like rinse and repeat, right? Um, so we just need to think very intentionally about the choices that we're making and the content that we're sharing. So specifically what I mean by that is looking at the features available within the platform. So, you know, you already kind of know it's available because you selected the event to exhibit at, but now you really need to dig in and make sure that you're maximizing those features, you know, for your brand, for your goal, and most importantly for this year, you know, what is it this year that you really need to make sure you're achieving? And one of the tips that we have is to make sure to ask the organizer what features they liked the best. Why did they choose that platform? Because there's a lot of platforms out there and knowing why the organizer chose the platform that they did is something that can really help you, um, you know, maximize your experience. So, you know, things like 
in an in-person world, we know what it means to network and we know what it means to set up appointments, right? But we don't always know what that looks like on a virtual platform. So it's worth asking. Uh, it's worth asking your, your organizer that so that you know how to do it and how to, how to leverage those tools. Okay, and now thinking about the nuts and bolts. Um, we talked a little bit about brand experience and making sure that you know, you're offering your attendees some kind of experience that really helps them understand who you are um, and maintain that really uh, that relationship. So you're going to want to use that as a guide when you upload your assets. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, this isn't really the, the time to do a rinse and repeat uh, strategy. I know that, um, you know, when I was an exhibitor, there was plenty of times where we brought the same booths and the same booth artwork to the same trade show every year. And maybe we were launching a new product, um, you know, so we had some new collateral, but overall the look and feel was was pretty much the same. And, and that was because it made sense. Um, our attendees didn't have changing demands. You know, we kind of understood where they were and what their challenges were, um, but you know, they're, they're changing. We're all, you know, there's a lot changing in the world right now. So just kind of keeping that in mind as you upload your, your assets and then also keeping in mind um, you're going to be in front of new new eyes, right? So the, your your event most likely will have people who have come to the event in, in the past, so lo loyalists, but you're also going to have new attendees who haven't attended in the past because either travel, cost, conflict, something like that. So um, when you're doing something like uploading your logo, I mean, and this is pretty simple and tactical, but this can add a lot of value, make sure that you have your tagline on there so that they know what you do before they actually select to enter your booth. And um, make sure that the videos and the images and that the content that you have meets the specs of the platform so that the overall UX, which is the user experience, is smooth. So you don't want someone walking into your booth and, you know, there's like a, a virtual banner that should be like this, but yours is, you know, like this. And so they can't read it. So those are just the little things that, um, you know, that you have to think a little bit more about with virtually or with, with exhibiting virtually. And, you know, I had mentioned before how important content is. So um, I'll, I'll bring up another point here, which is that um, think really critically about the content that you're uploading, like video content specifically. So because in, you know, the in-person world, you might have someone sitting at your booth and when someone walks in, they're engaging with them, they're talking to them, they have talking points. Um, that isn't, it isn't the same exact experience online. So, you know, invest in a welcome video and the welcome video should, you know, talk about the right products that are relevant to this audience. It should, um, you know, direct them maybe to a demo video, something like that. Um, it should acknowledge the event name. So, you know, hi, it's so nice to see you at, um, to make sure that it really does feel relevant. Um, and, you know, that just goes back to understanding that, um, you know, as, as operators and as, um, you know, retailers and bakers and everyone kind of in this industry, they're all facing a lot of different challenges right now. And, you know, what's keeping them up tonight is not the same as what was keeping them up um, last year. So, you know, you want to make sure your content really solves for those problems. And, um, you know, if it if you have a way to explain how it does that, it is really worth doing so. And I think we might have had a question. Yeah, we did. Um, it's what do you think will work better, doing live <laughs> demos or having demos already pre-recorded? Perfect time for a water break, sorry. <laughs> um, I think that's a really good question, actually. And um, it's interesting, one of the things that we've seen in our stat in the research that we've been able to access is that um, attendees have the ability to understand the difference of, um, of live content versus pre-recorded. So, if there's an option for a live demo, um, I would definitely recommend doing that. If not, then a pre-recorded demo makes sense. Um, but again, you'll want to make sure it's relevant. So you want them to feel like they're having that experience. So referencing, you know, thanks for coming and seeing us at this event, and we're going to show you, you know, this product. And I know a lot of a lot of you on this call today have really probably big machinery that's hard to show in a demo video. Um, but just keep in mind that the virtual world is very forgiving. I mean, hopefully you've all forgiven me that I couldn't get my PowerPoint up. Um, so, you know, don't overthink your video. Um, just make sure that you're you're being authentic, you're showing them the solution and that you're being relevant. And so, you know, if if you have the option for live, go go with live, but, um, you know, pre-recorded is great too. That was a really good question. Thank you. Emily, we have another one um, here. Uh -huh sort of based on training your team on the platform. Mm -hmm. So, you know, live trade shows usually means a lot of your team on the floor, face-to-face, -face, and it's the sales team. 
um, but with different responsibilities of the virtual shows, um, are you finding that new team members need to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the next two tips that we had is one, you know, make sure you're training everyone who's going to be in the booth, right? Because it's different. Again, you need to know, they know, they need to know the features and they need to know how to really maximize the, um, you know, the event to, to drive that ROI. But yeah, you have an opportunity to think about your booth staffing in a bigger way. Um, you know, there isn't the expense of flying everyone out. There isn't the expense of the hotel rooms and all of that. Um, and you're not necessarily like losing that time in the office because, you know, you can have someone in the event for maybe half of the day and then the other half of the day, they can kind of go back and do their regular work. So, you know, in addition to having your sales team and maybe your marketing team, you know, look at having technical product experts on board, look at having, you know, your R&D team and, and maybe even, you know, your product development team who helps with RAs. I know a lot of times when we were um, at one of our big events and saw kind of our bigger clients, they'd always want to talk about like, okay, these are the products that we're having issues with and these are the products that we want to, you know, expand in our line. So whoever you have that can help have those conversations, you'll definitely want to consider having them as part of your team. That was another really good question. And so I think, you know, the only other big point here that we wanted, that I wanted to share was, um, was about training, you know, when you are training your team, one of the tips that, that we have within that is that if you have, you know, say you have your sales team and they're going to be in the booth and they're going to want to talk to their existing customers. Um, we saw a report that exhibitors who have reported a really positive experience with virtual events and have driven a lot of ROI we're also finding, so they went into the event prepared with a list of their existing customers who they thought would be there, and they searched them out through the chat feature, um, and they talked to them. And, and then exhibitors who reported that they didn't have a very good experience or weren't driving ROI, we also asked them if they were searching out their customers through the chat feature, and they were not. Um, so that's, I mean, that is a really easy way to make sure that you have those conversations that don't always happen serendipitously. And I actually saw in a chat on a booth. Um, it was a, a virtual event that I attended last week. And, you know, one of the customers came in and was looking for the salesperson. And he was like, this, you know, it isn't, you know, I, I forget the event name. Um, he's like, it is an event if I don't get to talk to blah, blah, blah. And it just, it felt nice because it felt like, you know, you're seeing, you're still having a relationship with those people that you usually see in person. Um, so that's, that's just a really easy way to kind of get in front of them. Um, okay, so I was going to move over to the, the kind of marketing section, which um, is definitely one of my favorite topics, being that that's my current specialty. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to just see if there was any other questions. I think we got a couple really good ones. Actually, I do have one more question. Okay. Um, so as you've worked with clients, helping them develop their uh, virtual strategy, what are, what are their biggest misconceptions regarding virtual booths? Um, I think the biggest mi misconception is that they think about it as if it is a live event, but just online. And so they miss a lot of really good opportunities to generate that brand awareness and get outside of the booth. Um, so it, it, you know, you're still, you're still exhibiting at a trade show, but it's it's really different. It's a lot more, like I said, um, kind of operating in that attention economy. Um, so it's it's the mindset for how you plan the experience that you want your attendees to have. Does that answer the question, or is that too? Yeah, like, no, I think it's yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think most of it really is kind of a mindset thing of how how to think about generating that ROI and, and where where you will do it. It's different than how you would in a, in a live event. Okay, so the next section is uh, real marketing for virtual events. Um, you know, one of the things that MDG is often engaged uh, to, to help with by event organizers is to help exhibitors develop marketing plans um, and to kind of create some of those assets that they can use to promote their presence and participation at the event. Um, and so actually we have another question here, if Kelly, you wanna pop this one up. The question is, uh, who, who has heard the phrase or the saying, if you build it, they will come? I'll give everyone a second to answer that one. Okay. 
I'm sure it's a few people, if not everyone. Okay, so yeah, 85% of the people have heard that saying. Um, so, and that's been, that's been something in the events industry that was true for a long time, um, but it really isn't true when it comes to virtual. It's just not the case. Um, you know, you have to kind of keep in mind that again, we're really competing in that attention economy. Um, and, you know, your organizer is going to be investing heavily in marketing. Um, and, you know, they will bring attendees to the event. And the great thing that I mentioned earlier is that they're going to be bringing new attendees. So there's going to be, the, you know, a, typically speaking, there's the same kind of group who come every year. Um, and then, you know, the, the kind of new faces within companies and all of that. But what's really great about virtual is that those barriers are, are lower for participation. So, um, you know, you can have a lot more new attendees who are attending. Um, so that's something that I think is really great about um, exhibiting virtually. Um, but when, you know, when you're thinking about um, your organizer is doing a lot to do, you know, their part of bringing attendees, um, you know, if you're not developing a marketing plan to invite your customers, that's really a huge selling opportunity that's being lost. And, you know, one of the things that we often hear is that the top, I think it's one of the top three reasons that exhibitors do, do decide to attend and exhibit at an event is to have an opportunity to meet with some of those existing customers. Um, and, you know, defend those key relationships. I often hear, you know, if I'm not in front of my customers, someone else is. So, you know, that's definitely a key component is bringing those folks to the event so that you can put them in that opportunity to buy. Um, but, you know, you're also doing this, you're also developing a marketing plan to attract new customers um, and to, again, put them into that environment where you can accelerate that customer journey. Um, you know, they're going to become aware of your brand and your company. They're going to consume content and, you know, have some consideration around um, working with you. And sometimes that leads to an immediate sale. Sometimes it needs a little bit more nurturing. Um, but, you know, that's why it's so important to build out the marketing plan. And I'll share just a few tips on that. Um, so, you know, we talked about this a little, a little bit earlier, but I'm just emphasizing it here again, because I think it's one of the biggest opportunities with virtual events is to think outside of your event, or sorry, think outside of your booth. Um, you know, so participating in, in activities that they have outside of, you know, your booth includes speaking opportunities. Um, you know, maybe it's hands-on demos, uh, live stream workshops, things like that. We talked a little bit about live demos. So they might have like a demo area and you know, if you have an opportunity to participate in something like that, it's absolutely worthy. And I know that a lot of times going to an event as an exhibitor, you know, you already are putting in a lot of an investment by shipping all your materials and building your booth and all of that. But because you don't have that, you probably do have a little bit more of an option to, you know, maybe participate in the call for presentations and be a speaker, or um, you know, look at sponsorships and things like that. And if you are presenting online, um, one of the things that we found out in our research is that, um, you know, presenting online is different than it is in person. So just make sure that you're kind of practicing and, and testing out the technology and some of those different things. The organizer will definitely support that effort. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's kind of thinking outside of your booth. But when you're thinking about your marketing channels, you're going to want to look at probably a lot of the same marketing channels that you already use. So, you know, you're going to be doing um, you know, probably email and uh, social media and, uh, you know, updated website and maybe like an email signature, some of those different things. Um, but when you're doing that and when you're developing your messaging, it's really important to re-examine what uh, your attendees are struggling with right now, what your customers are struggling with today. So we talked about that before, but um, it's really relevant when you think about marketing messaging because, you know, like we talked about, what what struggles they had a year ago are different than the struggles that they're having today. So all of your solutions, all of your content really should focus on that. Um, I'm going to jump back in just while you're talking about the marketing plan components. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a submission in the chat that said, I've heard of sending out direct mail pieces that tie in with the event, possibly a sample kit, a sample kit um, or a fun virtual kit. Have you heard of various ways that companies are maybe doing things like this to stand out? Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge way to do it. And so there's kind of two strategies there. You can do you can do something in advance where usually the well, the organizer will make sure that they have all the addresses, the physical addresses of attendees, because obviously they've changed, right? You know, they're probably not at their offices. Some of us are, but not all of us. 
Um, so they usually get their home address, they verify where they are, and then they have like a sponsorship package option where you can kind of put a sample or swag item or whatever in there. And that's that's a huge, huge opportunity. So not all organizers do with virtual events, but if they do, um, I definitely recommend looking at that. And then another tactic that we'll talk about um, later is actually sending one of those after you've earned a lead in your booth as kind of a way to stay in touch with them. So that's that's a huge um, that's a huge opportunity and a really great idea. Another good question. Um, any other ones before I uh, talk a little bit more about some of the um, marketing tools? Keep asking. Not yet. Okay, they're all so good. Thank you guys for asking. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we were talking about kind of making sure that we're understanding where our attendees' minds are at, right? So there, there are challenges of change and we need to make sure that our content is addressing that. Um, but another thing to keep in mind as you're kind of building your marketing plan is that, um, again, we're competing in that attention economy. So it's okay to send a few extra emails to invite them. Um, you know, we're all on our computers, we're all on our screens. So we're getting a lot of emails and we're having a lot of kind of different ads and whatever pop up on our screens all the time. So if you need to send like, I don't know, two, three extra emails in your cadence than you would normally to invite them, um, you know, we're seeing uh, from the stats that we've been able to access that that's actually totally fine and you won't be pummeling them. So hopefully they agree um, if you do decide to utilize that tactic. Um, and, you know, one of the other things that we always recommend is making sure you're asking your organizer for those free marketing tools. So some of, sometimes there's free marketing tools. And then like we talked about with um, kind of like swag boxes and things like that, there's paid marketing options. Um, but make sure you're using the free marketing tools. Almost all organizers are going to have them. And the idea is uh, for it to help you promote your presence at the event. And when you're doing that, so usually it's like display ads and um, email templates and things that you can send out. Um, ask your digital team to add cookie tracking to your website so that you can kind of pixel any of the folks that are coming in and visiting your site um, or just, you know, ask your digital team if it makes sense. So there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, different ways to kind of track and get a little bit of data about seeing what's happening with, um, you know, with the ads that you're putting out there. So it's, it's something that we like to say grows your lead pool, even though you might not have someone's email address. If they visited your website and you pixeled them, you are you are still able to retarget them. So, um, you know, it's also about thinking about leads a little bit differently. And then the last tip, and what I would argue is maybe one of the most important, is create a post-show marketing plan. So, um, you know, that way, once you're done with your event and you've gotten all your leads, it's really easy for you to drop them into that sales funnel and get in front of them, you know, while they're still interested and in, in, um, your brand and your products are in front, uh, you know, top and center in their mind. Okay, so we've gone through, I think, four of our tips and we're just getting to the event. Um, and, you know, that's normal though with virtual. So one of the things that I think it's important for exhibitors to keep in mind when thinking about virtual events is that by putting in that thought and that planning up front, it's really going to pay off because, um, you know, all of the work that we do to get customers and to get attendees into our booth happens before the day of, um, which is, you know, different than when we are in um, an in-person event. So, you know, and just like you would in an in-person an in or a physical event, you know, you're going to want to provide your sales team with talking points um, specific to virtual. Um, you know, those might be conversation starters. So it's a lot easier, I think, to start a conversation when you're face to face and in person. There's that kind of serendip uh, serendipitous, you know, opportunity to kind of just strike conversation. Um, but what can help your sales team be a little bit more successful virtually is giving them conversation starters. So it might even be like, you know, what sessions have you attended and which did you enjoy? Or, um, you know, how are you enjoying the platform? Just things like that, where it's not like a, it's not like a closed ended question, it's an open ended question. So you can kind of get them talking and get them a little bit more um, comfortable having a conversation and knowing that the person on the other side of that chat is actually another person. We're not, um, you know, we're still people talking to people. It's just in a virtual environment. And before I go into the next tip, um, I have another question, and this is a little bit more of a rhetorical question, but you guys are welcome to answer in the chat if you'd like. Um, what did you do when you started to hear that stores had no toilet paper? 
seems like a long time ago, but it was only about nine months ago. My first thought, I think, was Amazon. My second thought was, well, no one's at the office. Maybe we can get some there. <laughs> That's smart. Um, actually, yes, there was some. There was someone who dropped toilet paper off at the office for us and said, hey, if you guys need some, and it went like that, right? So, you know, if you guys were like me or like Emily or Kelly or any of us, you know, you probably, you probably went to Amazon, you went to the grocery store, you went to the drugstore, um, you know, maybe even the hardware store. I definitely went to the hardware store. Um, <laughs> There was none left, but you know, and the reason wasn't because you wanted to be that bad person who hoarded eight months of toilet paper um, in their garage. You know, you did it because you wanted to make sure that you were not missing out. Um, you didn't want to feel like you were the only one who didn't have toilet paper, and then you know the resulting impacts of that. So we did get a great response, Emily. What we did get a great response. Oh, I, I have to hear it. I asked my mom for some. She's an avid couponer. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> she was prepared. She was ready for this. Prepared. Couponers are usually prepared. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know who to call next time. Um, so, okay. So the reason that I even asked you that question is, is because it's, it's a strategy that we like to leverage in our marketing efforts. Um, it's called the fear of missing out um, or FOMO. And, you know, you can leverage this strategy in your marketing and it's, it, I, I can't guarantee it's going to have the same impact. Um, but, you know, the idea still is that you want to drive action. You want to make someone feel like there's, um, you know, there's something that they have to be involved in or else they will miss out. So there's a couple ways to do that when you're preparing your virtual booth. Um, you know, one is something you probably would have already been doing in a physical trade show. And that is, um, you know, having your promotion, having some kind of on-site deal that's only available for a certain amount of time. You definitely want to have an end date because, again, you want to make sure that they feel that if they don't take that action by a certain point, that they would be missing out on that opportunity. Um, and I think we might have had another question. We had another super prepared uh, colleague, Teresa, who had so much on hand, she didn't need to buy any until June. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I was Teresa, not in that boat. I wouldn't tell too many people that, that know where you live. Right? <laughs> we found one like dinky little roll that was scented at like a liquor store down the street and my son was holding it and the, the guy who was checking us out was like you should take a picture and show him later he's he's not going to believe like how lucky you felt when you found that um you know so like i said i, I don't know that we can guarantee the same impact um but you know it is still it the idea is to really make sure that you're kind of leveraging that 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 fomo feeling so like I said, you know, you can do that through um, promotions, which definitely make a lot of sense to have at your virtual event. But something that you can have in a virtual event and in, in, you know, in your virtual booth that you don't really have all the time in a live event is digital activations. Um, so, you know, there, those are things like gamification, entertainment. Um, you know, when you're thinking about this tip, think about, you know, your brand experience being a little bit more like a Netflix or an Instagram than an in-person trade show. So, you know, realistically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to entertain or charm our attendees just as much as we're trying to educate and sell them. Um, so, you know, for those of you who attended IBIE in 2019, there was the um, AB Mori booth. And I think that it was Duff Goldman who was doing autograph signings. And that resulted in like a line around the booth and down the hall, and it probably left everyone uh, near their booth green with envy. So, you know, autographs of the celebrated baker might not work in a virtual setting, um, but, you know, there are ways to make sure that you're having some, you know, excitement and, and FOMO built into your experience. So, you know, think about having a live stream Q&A with a celebrity baker, um, maybe unique access to live dem demos or um, a baking class led by, um, you know, Master Baker. baker. This is uh, a serial hits. I think this was at an event recent, recently where he had kind of a virtual, um, like baking class. And so if you're having activities like that within your booth, uh, attendees are gonna wanna come in and they're gonna wanna see it and experience that. So the whole idea here is just making it exciting so that you can make it easier for the attendees to want to spend time with you. So any um, questions on kind of like the, the day of or what to think about when you're on site, on site before we move into our post-show wrap up? Nothing posted yet. 
Well, we can always go back and we'll have some time here at the end um, for, for questions. So, you know, the good news with um, virtual events is that, you know, there isn't the, the manual labor of uh, packing up your booth after three long days, four long days working at the trade show and then sitting at the airport because your flight's delayed. Um, you know, so, and I'm actually kidding because I personally cannot wait to get back to, <laughs> to a trade show in person. Um, I've, I've had some great times with friends and coworkers that shows and, you know, it always has a lot of energy. So I know that we do, um, you know, a lot of us do like that energy that you get uh, in person, but, you know, there's a lot of benefits to the post-show wrap-up when you're uh, exhibiting at a virtual event. So um, the first thing that I was going to do is I was actually going to ask a question. So maybe, um, Kelly, you can cue that one up. So the question is, what percentage of exhibitors follow up with their leads generated at trade shows? I'm going to go back because I don't want to give you guys the answer. Okay. Looks like this one will be wrapping up here. Okay, so what did you guys think? Okay, 33%. Okay, not bad. Um, so I will share with you the actual number of um, exhibitors who actually follow up with the leads that they generate. It's only 25%. So that means um, out of, you know, 100 exhibitors who go to a show and collect leads, only 25 of them are actually following up with those leads, um, which is, it's crazy. That's, I mean, that's, that's, driving ROI right there. And this is one study, so maybe it's wrong, but um, you know, the idea here is that if, if there's a lot of exhibitors who aren't actually following up with their leads, then we have to ask the question, why not? Um, and so what we found was that the reason a lot of them don't actually have like a, 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 a very specific or intentional follow-up with those leads is because, and this is again, bringing up something from earlier, um, they don't actually um, have a post-show plan ready when they get back. So, you know, talking about the marketing plan and developing a post-show um, marketing plan for following up with the leads that you get. So if you don't have that already done when you go back from a show, it's really easy just to kind of fall into the normal day-to-day um, -day and not get in touch with those leads very quickly. Emily, we did have a question pop up. Um, and it is, does that number change with virtual versus live? The percentage of follow-up? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I can find out in our next wave of research. I think that it probably does. I hope that it probably does. Um, but that's a really good question. So I'll, I'll see what I can find and get back to you guys. I think we're doing a, a similar roundtable in, in a couple of weeks. So I'll note okay. that as a follow-up topic. That was a good question. Um, but, you know, what I thought was really interesting about that was that, you know, the reason that they're not was because they don't have, you know, they don't have that plan of the follow-up email ready to drop those leads in. So I know that now everyone on this webinar will have their follow-up plan ready so that when they're done exhibiting, whether it's virtual or in person, um, are going to be able to drop those leads into their sales, funny, uh, sales funnel very quickly. And I think another stat that came out of that study that was really interesting was that um, of those exhibitors who did follow up with the leads, um, the ones who followed up first, like within the same product category, closed sales at a rate of 35 to 50% more. So, you know, not only are you going to drive ROI, ROI by following up, but following up quickly. Um, and a few final points when you're thinking about that follow up and kind of thinking about bringing those leads into your sales funnel is, you know, add them into your database. You know, you want to make sure that you're having all of those customers in the same CRM, um, but make sure, make it easier for you to invite them to the event next year or to reach out to them about something specific that you learned about them by adding in those notes. So, you know, you can add in, you, you know, most um, CRMs have a field for, for like lead source. So that lead source could be the event name. And then for notes, you know, if you knew that they were interested in a particular, um, you know, piece of machinery or, they were, you know, interested in a demo or something like that. Noting that down will help um, and having that in CRM will really help. And I know that, you know, anyone in, in the sales team really knows that and that's kind of a major ROI driver and it absolutely still applies with, with virtual exhibiting. Um, 
And this is this next point is what someone had brought up earlier, which is thinking about a post show activation. So there's a there's plenty of services out there that will do this, where you can kind of send like a branded swag box, and it can be swag that's tied back to your brand. It can be swag that um, you know ties back to the theme of the events. Kind of there's a lot of options there, and we recommend doing that because it's it's a lower cost way to stay in touch with them. And again, you know, you're not really going to be spending the same amount of money virtually as you would in person because you don't have to buy swag for everyone. Um, so you should be able to, you know, hopefully apply a little bit of budget there. And the benefit is that you're really taking that experience with your brand, with your brand beyond the screen, um, you know, putting something in their hands that has your brand name on it. Um, you know, and those are some of the biggest things with, with post-show. Like I said, it's actually a pretty, pretty easy post-show wrap up with uh, virtual events. So the last tip that I have today is bringing our presentation uh, full circle. So back to our goals, right? Um, we talked a little bit about KPIs. And one of the things that you're going to want to do is make sure that you're assessing the performance against the KPIs that you set in advance. Um, and, you know, virtual events have a lot of really rich data that the organizers should be able to share with you. So if someone entered your booth, you should be able to know about it. Um, you don't always have that opportunity when you're having, a, you know, when you're at a live event and not everyone lets you scan their badge and not, not all events kind of have those services. So when you're in a virtual setting, you, you get a lot more information about the, the people who visited your event. And most times you're actually able to follow up all, with all of them. So having all of that rich data and that information about how your event uh, performed will let you know if you know you you hit your goals and if you hit your KPIs. And so that that takes us through all of the points that we had. Um, so I just wanted to see if uh, we wanted to kind of open it up for questions. If anyone had any more, I do have a question, Emily. Um, so 2020 ended up being you know basically completely virtual. If we want to talk about a word of the year, virtual. Uh, which 2021 is looking very hybrid. So yeah. when it's a hybrid event and you have the option to be both virtual and in person, um, that feels like two completely different teams possibly. And you've described tips for before, during, and after the event. How closely do those two teams need to be working throughout those stages? So it really depends on the actual event. Um, we talk a lot at MDG and Freeman about what hybrid means. And, you know, there hasn't, we haven't, the industry hasn't really landed on a definition. So sometimes that means that the event is completely in person. And then afterwards there's a virtual, you know, there's recordings and people can kind of still access some of that content or, um, you know, explore the virtual exhibit booths. Um, but in a setting where, you know, let's say there's like a live exhibit floor that's in person. And then there is also a virtual component of that exhibit floor. Um, in that situation, you know, you might you might actually have all of your team there together, um, but maybe the folks who are exhibit who are you know manning the kind of virtual area are in a or maybe they're in, they're in the hotel or maybe they're kind of you guys are switching. It depends on the booth size. Um, so you know you can do that if you want everyone there and available, or you can have half of your team at the actual event and then maybe a smaller team back you know at your office and. Um, but you know, right now we're still very much in this world of uh, virtual events, and you know, there's been a few events, live events that have happened, um, and I think that through the year we'll see more live events and hybrid events, and so that will develop a little bit more, kind of as we see uh, the trial and error that might come out of it. Yeah, that'll be a nice um, development for the teams, new ways of working yeah. together. Yeah. There's, there's, there's more um, innovation coming for, for the event world this year. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, that is um, all of the questions that we currently have. I haven't seen any more pop up in the Q&A box. So we want to thank you uh, for presenting today and sharing all of your tips with us. Um, we wanna thank our attendees for attending the webinar today and be sure to join us on February 9th at 11 a.m. We have our next marketing and trade shows roundtable. Um, Emily will be joining us again to answer questions and um, seems people think of them about five minutes after the webinar ends. Um, oh, I wish I would have asked. Um, I actually just saw one pop up. So I'll stop my closing remarks and check that question. 
Um, the IDDBA is coming up the first week. Oh, it's a, just a lovely comment. The IDDBA is coming up the first week of February, and she's very pleased at the timing of this webinar. Rhonda, you are welcome. Yeah, and if you, uh, you know, I meant to actually add my information to the slide deck. Um, so uh, maybe we can, we'll, I think we'll send this out and it'll be posted. So I'll add it there. If there's ever a time when, you know, you guys are preparing for a virtual event and you're not sure to how to leverage the opportunities and kind of where to start or any questions on anything that I said, um, absolutely reach out. I'm happy to, to kind of talk and brainstorm about any of this. We appreciate that. Um, okay, so February 9th at 11 is the Marketing and Trade Shows Roundtable. Um, if you're interested in joining that uh, roundtable discussion, you just email Kelly Allen to register and you can also find information about that on our website. Um, so again, Emily, thank you so much for being with us today. And to all of our attendees, have a great afternoon and we'll see you next time. <laughs>